and we are uh, pleased to be here kicking off day two of our third annual uh, conference on the South China Sea. Uh, as you know, it's, uh, the conference is titled uh, Managing Tensions in the South China Sea. I'd also like to welcome our online audience. Uh, we had a very large uh, online audience yesterday and a lot of uh, participation and coverage by uh, Twitter. So uh, welcome to all of you out there. Our, our panel uh, to kick off this morning um, is uh, focused on the role of international law in managing disputes. Uh, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Each of them will talk for roughly 10 minutes, and then we'll open the floor for uh, question and answer. Um, for those of you who are following us on Twitter and want to participate and ask questions, uh, please follow us uh, on Twitter at Southeast Asia DC and at CSIS, or follow the hashtag uh, CSIS Live. Uh, that's uh, CSIS Live. Oh, uh, it's my honor this morning to introduce a, a, a very uh, well qualified panel. Um, uh, and I'll start with our, our friend, um, Dr. Shinjun Zhang, who has flown in from Beijing uh, just last night and told me that he, uh, because of the dragon boat races, has to fly back uh, to Beijing, I think, tonight uh, to, <laughs> to tomorrow teach, morning. tomorrow morning to teach. So uh, he's a true uh, a marathoner of uh, international travel. We're, we're very grateful that he uh, would make, make, make the time to uh, be with us today. Um, he is an associate professor of public and international law at, at, at Tsinghua University in Beijing. His research includes the, the law of the sea, international environmental law, nonproliferation law, and, and law treaties. He's the executive director of the Center for the Law of the Sea Study uh, at, the, uh, at the Tsinghua Law School and a member of the International Law Association. So, highly qualified to speak on these issues. Next to him, uh, Henry Bencerto uh, is the former Secretary General of the Secretariat of Commission on Maritime and Ocean Affairs, or the CMOA, uh, which is a cabinet level interagency coordinating body on the law of the sea and other maritime issues. Um, Henry, uh, for those of you who track uh, the um, South China Sea issues is, a, is definitely, I think, one of our eminent persons, uh, one of the top lawyers who are thinking about these issues uh, representing the Philippines. So it's great to have him here with us today. Next to him is our own Peter Dutton uh, from the United States. Peter is a professor of strategic studies and director of the China Maritime Studies Institute at the U.S. Naval War College. Um, he uh, joined the Institute in 2007 and became the director in 2011. His research focuses on maritime sovereignty and boundary issues, boundary disputes uh, involving China, international law of the sea, and maritime strategy. Uh, I think Peter is, uh, has been with us, I think, for all three of our uh, conferences. I missed last year. Oh, he missed last year, sorry. So, uh, but Peter is, uh, Peter, great to have you back. And finally, um, Last but not least, as we talked about when we were preparing for this panel, uh, our cleanup hitter is Dr. Uh, Wen, Wen Dong Thang. He is a general international lawyer and obtained his uh, international relations uh, degree from the Institute of International Relations, which is now the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. And he has a, a law degree from the law school um, at the School of Law in the University of Nottingham in the UK, and a PhD in the Faculty of Law University at Cambridge uh, that he just earned uh, in two, uh, this year. He's a member of the Vietnam Lawyers Association since 2000, um, and is uh, a well-known um, Vietnamese lawyer and writer uh, on international legal issues pertaining to the law of the sea, ocean development, and international law. So great honor to, uh, to have him with us also today. So I'm going to turn first uh, uh, to our colleague uh, from Beijing, who uh, hopefully isn't too jet lagged. And, uh, and uh, he can start us off. Thank you very much. All right. 
CSIS uh, inviting me here. Uh, anyway, uh, my my talk today, uh, you can you can see the title, and that's exclusively the result of my research, and doesn't necessarily reflect uh, the the position of Chinese government. Um, <clears throat> First, I'd like to have uh, your two backgrounds. Uh, the one is uh, in view of, of the Chinese government uh, on the, in the rule of international law in settling the boundary dispute. Uh, well, I would like to refer you to look at uh, the Chinese practice uh, since 1990s on the land boundary issues. Uh, I think that's what importance is China discards uh, the unequal treaty doctrine. I think some of you may uh, may familiar with that, uh, <coughs> but rely more on the positive in international in terms of uh, of treaties uh, managing the dispute. Uh, the the second one is on the maritime boundary dispute. Uh, I would like to suggest you to look at to setting the side dispute and pursuing joint development policy. That policy is consistent uh, ever since 1970s when China had the disputes with Japan on the Diaoyu Senkaku Islands um, <clears throat> and maintained even today uh, on the issues of Ch South China Sea. The essence of this policy uh, in terms of means of peaceful settlement of dispute is that to put negotiation as a primary means, which in my view uh, it's, uh, it's not a problem at all uh, in terms of um, the UN law, if especially uh, Article 2.3 and Article 33.1. Um, <clears throat> but I think as a party state, and it may face challenge uh, uh, if referring the dispute settlement procedure in NCLOS. Uh, fundamental difference I see here uh, on the NCLOS uh, from the UN system is that in principle um, <coughs> in the NCLOS uh, dispute, uh, in principle can be referred, uh, shall be referred by one party state, uh, if you feel like, to a procedure which entailing binding will make this decision tailing binding <coughs> decisions. So that exactly happened when uh, our Philippine friends initiated the arbitration uh, early this year. Uh, anyway, in order to fully understand the discussion, the following, I would like to uh, post certain uh, articles as well as declarations. Uh, I think the most important one is so-called promissory clause uh, of Article 286. Uh, <clears throat> it says that subject to Section 3, any dispute concerning the interpretation or application of this convention shall, where no settlement has been reached by recourse to Section 1, be submitted at the request of any party to the dispute to the court or tribunal having jurisdiction under this section. What important is here is that there's three conditions. Uh, uh, conditions re required um, the party who unilaterally submit the dispute. Uh, <coughs> the condition now explained later. Uh, especially this condition subject to Section 3, uh, Article 298 is part of Section 3, which gives an optional exception to the application to the application of uh, <coughs> Section 2, uh, the binding uh, decision procedure, saying that when signing, ratifying, or acceding to the convention, at any time a state may, um, without prejudice to obligations rising under Section 1, declare in writing that it does not accept any one or more of the pro procedures provided in Section 2 with respect to one or more of the following categories of the disputes, such as disputes concerning interpretation of application of Article 15, 74, 83, relating to sea boundary delimitations or those involving historical base or titles. And that is exactly what China did in accordance with its provision uh, <coughs> in October 2006, saying that uh, PRC does not accept any of the procedures provided in Section 2, blah, blah, blah. So why not participate? Um, 
I think that the first is as a matter of auto interpretation. Any uh, party state who do not uh, want to appear in the court, uh, they will make decision on the belief that the court or tribunal does not have jurisdiction. Uh, it, you may say that's a silly belief, uh, but anyway, uh, it must uh, make the decision uh, upon this belief. Um, <clears throat> But in case that the jurisdiction of the court is solely relied on a compromissory clause, uh, I think that respondent state must have a lot to say regarding the interpretation of that clause. Um, it, it is suggested that uh, that auto interpretation might have been well undergone uh, in the review by China upon ratification of N clause. Uh, so even before the arbitration initiated this year. Uh, <clears throat> otherwise, we can hardly understand uh, the, you know, the normal cause of the state one ratifying a treaty. Normally, the country who ratify the treaty and have the intention to be bound by that treaty will think that is will will have will do that on the belief that is domestic law and policy will not in violation to the, the treaty provisions. Anyway, by the end of the day, one Philippine challenged the policy and initiated the Annex 7 procedure, the validity of the interpretation of that clause. I think here is also the validity of the claims based on the jurisdictional title, based on the compar uh, compromissory clause raised by Philippines, will inevitably be subject to the arbitration uh, review. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we all know that there is public domain, there is a lot of disputes on, uh, discussions on that. So China must be prepared for all this and ensure its interpretation is not uh, at least a silly one. And in my view, I believe that China's interpretation of Article 286's compromissory clause is reasonable regarding this non-appearance as a respondent state vis-a-vis -vis the Philippines, as well as to the tribunal's argument on tri tribunal's ju jurisdiction. I will present the following reasons. So I agree uh, in general that a response, respondent state can fully justify its non-appearance or non-participation. Only one no prima facie jurisdiction basis has been presented by the applicant. That is the case in 1955. Therefore, <coughs> when a compromissory clause with a normal formula formulation um, was relied by the applicant state for the jurisdictional, ba arguing jurisdictional basis, the responses can hardly resist it by not participating or not appearing. Uh, anyway, there are two fundamental points that China would believe that the tribunal does not have any jurisdiction on the dispute formulated by the Philippines in its application. One is that the dispute, by its very nature, a dispute over the territory of Nansha Islands, or inseparable from uh, the territory dispute. China will not participate otherwise to make constitute a acquiescence to the Philippines' claims over certain islands that China believed as <coughs> illegally occupied by the Philippines, or its argument that islands dispute irrelevant to the present case. So from mere jurisdictional matter of that point, China may argue that the territorial dispute is nothing relevant to the interpretation or application of the convention uh, of that uh, clause. The other important one is uh, the interpretation is on the interpretation of subject to section three uh, of article 286, 287, or 286. So here I would like to have you to, to pay attention on this uh, uh, clause. It is quite a euro format, not like any compromissory clause that has been relied by parties when they uh, apply in the ICJ. The jurisprudence never in my study, never had such an experience. Um, uh, this article, Article 286, contains a clause within the structure of its own that permits a party state to make a declaration to preclude automatically 
uh, or by op optional declaration certain categories mm -hmm. so concerning interpretation application. That makes the whole interpretation issues complicated. The, in the importance here is, I say, it's unique for MAT. It sets the equal footing for the, uh, the applicant states as well as the re respondent state. The court of tribunal needs to give them equal treatment in mm -hmm. deliberating whether it shall have jurisdiction when setting so-called jurisdiction or test regarding the dispute in the preliminary phase. That is, um, for example, how far it may consider the claims in fact in the preliminary stage, how far it will interpret specific clause which is alleged to be part of or excluded from the interpretation of uh, or application of, of the treaty. Uh, the second point, why not uh, participate? I will, sit, I will argue that it's also a matter of calculation. Um, there's through three calculations. The first, based on, okay, based on the, <coughs> the provisions in the convention itself. Um, uh, in general, there's no default judgment here. Um, of course, there's demerits from the, the, the convention. For example, China cannot nominate its own uh, arbiter uh, <coughs> to, the, to the case. Um, <coughs> also, there's calculation based on ICJ jurisprudence. I listed several cases that uh, some of the countries, including the United States, dis did, not dis did not appear in the, in the court. But the result is not always uh, in favor uh, to the applicant. I mean, the respondents sometimes also got their points in the in the final judgment. Um, other considerations I passed here. Implication, finally. Um, I think the, by non-participating in the case, uh, it provides uh, with that China a strong political mm -hmm. argument <coughs> that may be employed to resist attempts to enforce any adverse judgment. That is quite sure on that point. Um, but in the meantime, I think the tribunal's involvement may have motivated the parties to pursue settlements before a final judgment. I was seen a number of cases of ICJ that it's been resolved the dispute out of the court prior to final judgment. And even there is a final judgment, and one party does not intend to bite to follow it, uh, there is still possible for them to have a final settlement achieved by negotiation. And if the judgment is made in favor of Philippines, then the Philippines may use it in the negotiation. Anyway, um, China still, I think, uh, in the whole uh, before all after the, the judgment, uh, I think China still need to uh, pay very much attention uh, in terms of negotiation with the Philippines. That is all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, may we turn now to uh, Henry Bensurto, please. Uh, thank you, Ernie. Thank you. First, um, Pardon my jet lag, I also arrived last night, so if uh, at some point I become incoherent, uh, blame it to the jet lag. But uh, at the same time, uh, I'd, for me to be frank, open, and candid in the discussion, and I think, I suppose, that's the start of any fruitful discussion on any issues, I will have to invoke a modified rule on Chatham House rules, which means that uh, if I say something right, uh, owe it to the government. If I say something wrong, it's my personal liability. Uh, <clears throat> Having said that, let me proceed. Okay, so. All right. So, uh, the title of the presentation is The Role of International Law in Managing Disputes in the South China Sea. There are two basic terms here the role of international law, and then managing disputes. I'll forego with that because I've been given 10, 10 minutes only, but that's self-explanatory. Let me start the discussion by saying certain principles, preparatory st statements that I think uh, 
uh, is the overview of my presentation, and that is that there is a need to manage the escalating tension in the South China Sea so that they don't deteriorate into conflict. That the disputes in the South China Sea are complex. By no means are we saying it's simple. And so therefore, any dispute management approach in the South China Sea should be multifaceted, multidimensional, and nuanced. That being said, international law plays a key role. It's not the end all be all, but it plays a very fundamental role in managing the disputes. And that's why any management architecture in the South China Sea must be anchored on international law. Let me therefore explain those prefatory statements in terms of the following, in the following outline. I'll discuss the nature of international law, and then from there go to the relationship between international law and management architecture in the South China Sea, the escalating tension in the South China Sea and the lessons learned, and from there, the recommendation, proposed management architecture and the role of international law in terms of managing the disputes. And then I'll go into a compulsory arbitration, which is really part and parcel of that solution from our perspective. And then I'll go with my own conclusion. Let me start by saying that international law essentially is, uh, uh, in its simplest form, essentially, are the norms and principles that regulate the conduct of interstate relations. So essentially, it is fundamental in any society, whether it's domestic. And if you look at the, at the international relations as a community of nations, we're also saying the same thing, that law is essential in its constitution and its preservation. And that's why if you are going to consider yourself as part of that community of nations, you have to subject yourself within the parameters of international law. And that's why terms such as rogue states or etc. refer to those countries which operate outside of the parameters of international law. In the sphere of conflict avoidance and conflict prevention, uh, the rule of law operates to prevent, manage, and even resolve disputes. Actually, that's the role that international law plays. And some of the principles of international law, just to give you some ideas, are peaceful settlement of disputes, non-use of force, or non-use of threat of use of force, equality of states. So these are just some of the principles of international law that can actually be applied uh, in any given situation where there is a dispute. And in the, in the context of the South China Sea, in fact, international plays a role. Why? Because all of the parties including the claimant parties, invoke international law. So in a sense, what you can see there is that international law becomes a common language where everybody speaks. The question is, what is your interpretation? What is my interpretation? And that's why later on I will go to the subject of arbitration. That hopefully would settle what is the correct interpretation in an objective basis. Not just one's standards or another standards, but on a standard uh, provided by a third party. In fact, some of the principles of international law are already incorporated in the Declaration of Conduct. So in a sense, the problem in the South China Sea is not the absence of a management architecture. We have the management architecture, and that is the ASEAN-China Declaration of Conduct. And the ASEAN Declaration of Conduct, which was concluded in 2002, already contained these principles. The problem in the South China Sea, therefore, is what is the right management architecture? That is the question, not the absence. Some of the principles, for example, of the Declaration of Conduct, which contains certain principles of international law, the, the slide will show that. But I would like to emphasize paragraph five and paragraph four. Paragraph five, for example, talks about the norm that you're not supposed to occupy unoccupied features. To give you a background, the Declaration of Conduct came as, a, as an offshoot, actually, of the 1998 Mischief Reef incident, when Mischief Reef or Panganiban Reef was actually occupied. And therefore, when you had this declaration of conduct, the heart and soul of that declaration is paragraph five. That is supposed to preserve the status quo when this, treat, when this declaration was actually concluded in 2002. And therefore, what paragraph five simply means that there should be no more actually occupation of any unoccupied features. So as you can see, the management ar architecture that is already in place contains those principles. Yet, despite these principles and despite the management ar architecture presented by the Declaration of Conduct, one may ask, 
why, why is there still tension? And not only is there tension, but the tension seems to escalate to the point where we are right now. So in a sense, that management architecture concluded in 2002 was actually not able to prevent what it intended to prevent. That is from tension from escalating uh, into something that is already of a nature of a conflict. So just to illustrate, by, by 2009, you had the first official announcement in an official way uh, as to the nine dash line. Uh, and then from there, you had an assertion on Reed Bank, which is about 85 nautical miles away from Mischief Reef, which is about 124 nautical miles. Now it's nearer to about 85 nautical miles. The difference between Mischief Reef and also Reed Bank is that Mischief Reef, a low tide elevation that sometimes is above water, uh, Reed Bank is completely submerged underwater. And so one may ask, how can you have a historical claim over an area where there is no concept in the first place in the 12th century? Uh, the concept of continental shelf is a creation of contemporary modern international law, essentially, uh, presented by the Truman Declaration. And from there, it developed. And then from, from Reed Bank, there was an assertion about 60 nautical miles away and 30 nautical miles away on, on another oil blocks, which are also continental shelves, oil blocks three and four uh, near Palawan. And then last year, in 2012, you had the incident now in Scarborough. This morning, I received information from the home office that there are indications that structures are being built right now. This is trying, we're trying to confirm that, but there are indications we're going in that direction. And then in 2012, for the first time, since 1997 to 2012, early part, uh, if you're going to look at the South China Sea as a quadrant, there used to be a fishing ban imposed by China with respect to the first quadrant involving Vietnam. Last year, we saw the escalation. This moved westward to include the second quadrant. And, and therefore, we have that fishing ban now imposed practically on half of the, the two quadrants of the South China Sea. And then the nine all blocks of China were proposed for development last year as well. Uh, the problem with this is they are in the exclusive economic zone of Vietnam. And then the establishment of the uh, uh, Sanchez City, which actually has jurisdiction over, uh, well, there's a confusion here. Uh, you, you see mixed signals uh, actually, whether it's on the entire South China Sea or just the features. And then early this year, we have an expedition in James Shoal. James Shoal is essentially very symbolic because it's the farthest point in the Nine Dash Line, which is about 85 nautical miles from the coast of Malaysia. And then this year, as we speak right now, there's a low tide elevation where we have a, we have a contingent since 1998, and it's being threatened for another Scarborough Shoal. Uh, the problem, the difference between Scarborough Shoal and a Jungian shoal is that in, in Scarborough, there is no structure, there's no contingent in uh, military contingent. Here, in a Jungian shoal, there are military contingent. Uh, uh, there is some military contingent from the Philippines and it's being threatened. As of uh, two days ago, uh, some ships have been seen as, as near as two, two nautical miles away. Uh, actually, so and this has been a growing pattern where you have also fishing vessels uh, in front. And then, of course, now on an increasing pattern, the sovereignty patrols uh, that's been happening there. I have a problem with sovereignty patrols. What does that exactly mean? Uh, actually, anyway, in the open forum, that can be clarified what that exactly means. How does it impact in the freedom of navigation, etc.? At some point, maybe not today, but tomorrow, how is it going to be? When I say tomorrow, 15 years down the line. So therefore, given this situation, what are the reasons for the escalation of the tension? Why was the DOC as a management structure unable to prevent this tension? And then what can we do to address actually these gaps, if there are gaps in the DOC? And then how can we use international law in an effective way to actually manage these disputes? So from, 
from, from some of the analysis, there are, there are views expressed that the reason, one reason why the DOC failed in preventing the tension is because it is not legally binding. It's a declaration of principles, political principles. By no means does it impose oblig ob uh, um, uh, 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 obligations on any parties in a legal way. And then there is a lack of clarity in the nature of disputes or maritime entitlements. This is an area that was discussed during the negotiation of the DOC, but for some reasons or another, everybody wants to be nice with each other. Let's forego those issues. They were not discussed, and eventually they came back to us in a big way. So. From our perspective, therefore, it is necessary that the nine dash line must be clarified. Maritime entitlements of all coastal states, including China, must be clarified. As a management mechanism, how do we operationalize shelving territorial disputes and engage in cooperation? And in this regard, how can we use international law to do this? So these are some of the points of international law as a dispute management tool I've been given. I have to wrap up. So let me go to the, to the so. UNCLOS provides us certain principles by which we can clarify maritime entitlements. I'll go very fast on this. Territorial sea, contiguous zone, exclusive economic zone. These are the maritime entitlements enshrined. And so that gives us, a, and the, if you apply those principles in the South China Sea, this is how it's going to be to look like, actually. In case of overlap, UNCLOS also provides us certain principles by which you can actually negotiate those overlaps. Essentially, maritime delimitation can be done on a median line basis. I'll, maybe in the Q&A if there are questions. And then on the question of the features on the South China Sea, including the Spratis, they can actually be uh, addressed by Article 21, 121 on the regime of islands. There is a distinction between an island and a rack and a low tide elevations. Maybe in the Q&A we can go on with that and therefore that can also be clarified. So in a sense, international provides us a very good idea of how to address these matters. And international is not lacking in those principles. So in terms of the clarification of disputes in the South China Sea, and this is where there is a distinction between territorial disputes and maritime disputes. Territorial disputes refer to the question of who owns the features, as opposed to maritime disputes, which actually refers to entitlements. And this is one way of approaching this matter, that once you're able to distinguish the two, you can have an idea of how to approach the South China Sea, and you can use international law, essentially. So in the case of the South China Sea, the territorial disputes refer mainly to the features but at the same time, it also refers to the territorial sea because territorial sea is an extension of your sovereignty. This is the territorial dispute. And these are the different occupants. But the maritime dispute is not, is not necessarily territorial dispute. They can be disaggregated. And so, the, the terri and, and so when you apply all those principles, you can go with the following process, that not the whole of the South China Sea is territorially disputed, that the area of territorial dispute in the South China Sea is specific, determinable, and measurable, that the area of territorial dispute can be determined and measured by clarifying the nature of and distinction between territorial claims and maritime claims or disputes in the South China Sea, that the nature and distinction between territorial disputes and maritime disputes can be clarified and that the territorial dispute in the South China Sea is principally on the relevant features extending to the territorial waters on the, on the principle of land dominating the sea. And then once the extent of the territorial dispute in so far as the land feature and the territorial sea is concerned, you can now actually apply shelving of territorial disputes using the process of enclaving, which is done by many courts actually in deciding uh, disputes of this nature. And by doing that, you're now able to segregate what is territorial disputed from the rest of the waters. By doing that, you're, you now enable yourselves to engage in cooperation. If you look at this room, for example, constituting of 100 people, if there are seven people here who are infected with a bird flu, it's very difficult for us to engage each other because you don't want to be infected by bird flu. What do you do? You segregate the seven people who are infected with the bird flu, put them in a room, quarantine them, and then apply the necessary medication. The rest of the people can engage in a better way with no, with no fear of being infected. 
but you don't co kill the seven people. You let time decide that, uh, and you let medicine develop, right? But the, the rest of the people who are healthy can now engage each other. This is what we're saying in the South China Sea. You can now apply part nine, which actually talks about maritime cooperation. And so you can have this as a way of cooperating, as a way of managing. And you can have the specific code of conduct on those areas where you have territorial dispute. And you can actually convert them into marine protected areas. And so joint development can now be, is now a possibility. It's very difficult to have a joint development when you have the 9-9 not clarified. Why? Because the 9-9 practically covers 85% of all the EEZs of other countries. For me, therefore, when I claim somebody else's suit, that's nice, right? We can share your suit, even if I didn't spend anything on that. But because I have a 45, you have to share that suit. But because I'm nice, you can wear that suit today, but tomorrow I have to. So I'm nice, we can share that suit. I think that's a wrong way of approaching joint development. You have to clarify the area and when you are able to clarify the area, you can identify what are the appropriate joint development areas. So, I'm going to forego the technicalities because I have only 10 minutes, but if there's going to be a discussion on the arbitration, I'm pretty much open on that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Henry. Uh, Peter, uh, could we turn to you, please? Uh, I don't know what that says about lawyers. But, and, uh, and gone over time. Yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Okay. Um, what is the role of international law in managing the disputes in the South China Sea? Uh, this question is really twofold. The first part is what, objectively speaking, can law uh, play to, to manage the disputes in the South China Sea? The second aspect of the question is what, subjectively speaking, are the parties to these disputes willing to allow the law to play in managing these same disputes? So let's start with the first question. Um, what role can law play? The most significant strength of international law, especially international treaty law, is its ability to establish norms of expected behavior among the community of sovereign states. This normative power of international law should not be underestimated for its ability to drive and shape the behavior of states towards stabilizing, predictable behavior. Maritime disputes in particular have benefited from the normative power of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. In East Asia, in many ways, there's a pattern of close conformity to the norms established by UNCLOS. Unfortunately, in my view, China represents uh, one of the countries that has not yet fully adopted its norms. China maintains numerous excessive non-normative baseline claims and an ambiguous claim of historic or other rights uh, within the nine dash line that has no basis under UNCLOS, among other concerns. On the positive side, even with its remaining deficiencies, China is party to UNCLOS uh, uh, and has fully incorporated many of its other provisions into its domestic laws and also takes an active part in the organizations established by the convention to further develop international law of the sea. The Philippines, on the other hand, is an excellent example of a country that made the political decision to embrace full normative conformity with the provisions and requirements of UNCLOS as a way to enhance its power status in relationship to its maritime claims. Prior to 2008, the Philippines labored under a centuries-old colonial articulation of its maritime sovereignty that bore no resemblance to current international law, but which was enshrined in its constitution and was therefore very politically difficult to change. Nonetheless, by spring 2009, the Philippine government found the political will to bring every aspect of its domestic legislation into full conformity with UNCLOS, throwing off centuries-old non-normative claims based on the vestiges of history. It's really quite admirable. In doing so, since many of its maritime claims conflict with those of uh, China and, and Vietnam, as we know in some ways, the Philippines is leading its stronger neighbors by example. 
Thus, objectively, international law has the power to bring the behavior of states into alignment, some more, some less, in ways that contribute greatly to, the global, to global stability. And it has done so in East Asia through the mechanism of UNCLOS. Subjectively, however, states appear to continue to choose to deviate from legal norms when they perceive that those norms do not sufficiently protect their objectives or interests, and when they have the power to shield themselves sufficiently from the consequences of noncompliance. Thus, there is an inextricable link between power and law. The role of international law cannot be divorced from power. What roles uh, are regional states willing to allow law to play? The second question. The diagram uh, lays out lays out the five basic framework uh, approaches to international dispute resolution. The spectrum begins with three diplomatic or institutional options. The first of these is direct bilateral negotiations between disputing parties. The second is multilateral negotiations, either through an appropriate institution, such as ASEAN or the UN, or undertaken on an ad hoc basis among the various disputing parties. The third is to submit the dispute to an arbitration or litigation process through an appropriate international legal institution. Institution. The fourth and fifth approaches are power-based, non-militarized coercion, and armed conflict. Of these five approaches, China's stated preference is bilateral negotiations to resolve conflict. But these negotiations have gone nowhere over the past two decades because China demands more than its negotiating partners are willing to give up. I've been told by uh, folks from, from both Vietnam and the Philippines that in negotiations, the Chinese begin with sovereignty is ours, now we can negotiate. And this is too much. They can't, the negotiating partners can't begin from there. So China has also participated in multilateral negotiations in the past, and this has led to some successes, including the Declaration of Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea. But by 2008, the Chinese had concluded that only they were negotiating in good faith and that the other disputing parties were taking advantage of Chinese restraint to seize control of valuable hydrocarbon resources. The Chinese thereafter sought actively to divide ASEAN to forestall any meaningful collective pressure from that direction. Likewise, the Chinese have so far refused to submit to international arbitration or litigation, perhaps because they know that international law does not support many of their assertions, especially their more expansive claims, such as jurisdictional claims over the waters of the South China Sea based on the Nine Dash Line. On the power side of the equation, China has been deterred over the past few decades from using armed conflict to resolve the disputes. But since 2008, China's strategic emphasis has settled into the gap between armed conflict, from which it has been deterred, and institutional approaches from which it, which it found to be ineffective to advance its interests. In the gap between these strategies lies the power-based approach of non-militarized coercion. Only one aspect, in my view, of China's strategy can be said to involve international law. China uses the language of the law to justify its claims and its right to use power to pursue them. Regrettably so far, China has chosen not to formally conform its South China Sea claims to relevant international law or to use international legal mechanisms to help resolve its maritime disputes with its neighboring states. China's strategy includes the use of power and even low levels of force, but not international law or its international mechanisms. The Philippines, on the other hand, as a relatively weaker state, closely allied with the United States to protect its security interests has, predictably, been much more supportive of international law and international legal mechanisms to try to resolve maritime disputes in its favor. This led the Philippine government to update its domestic law, to bring its claims into conformity with international law, and to use international arbitration as its, as its mechanism of dispute resolution. So far, China continues to reject participation in the arbitral process initiated by the Philippines, even though arbitration will continue without them. A, a very important outcome of this case could be that China is faced with the embarrassment of the formal international rejection of its claims and a clear reinforcement of the rules and norms concerning rights and obligations at sea that UNCLOS establishes. How, would, how China would react to being so clearly set on the wrong side of widely accepted international law remains to be seen. 
Continued failure by China to participate in the process, or worse, a decision to ignore unfavorable results, would be a signal from Beijing that no amount of international disapproval will sway it. Thus, since there is a relationship between power and international law and norms, another impact could be to encourage others in the region and beyond to enhance, uh, uh, to, to enhance their uh, coercive capacity and engage in accelerated balancing activities in order to reinforce their claim strength and their overall security in the face of a more powerful China. Given the political and military cost to China of remaining outside the normative legal process, Perhaps the single biggest impact of the Philippine arbitration is that it does, in fact, incentivize China to reopen the avenue of bilateral negotiations on terms that are more realistically acceptable to the Philippines and their other negotiating partners. I have to ask, though, will the Philippines be equally flexible and willing to reopen the negotiations as a way to save Chinese face and help in that way to bring stability to the region? This could be the most effective outcome of the arbitration process. And one of the real true benefits of using international law is that it drives parties back to negotiation, meaningful, effective negotiation. So what should the US role be in reinforcing international law? To date, the United States has carved out two roles for itself in supporting peaceful resolution of East Asian maritime disputes. First, and most importantly, American alliances, security partnerships, and security guarantees in combination with the maintenance of strong military power resident in East Asia have so far taken military conflict, the fifth approach discussed in the framework above, off the table as a method of dispute resolution. Second, the U.S. does use its persuasive power to reinforce international law norms and its diplomatic power to encourage the disputing parties to resolve their conflicts through peaceful means. That is the first three approaches, Green, uh, discussed in the framework to my right. The U.S. has so far played a very limited role in affecting Beijing's calculations about the fourth framework option, that of pursuing non-military strategy. I'll leave that for discussion in, in, in question and answer, if you'd like, to uh, talk about that further. But I have four policy recommendations. First, the US must maintain deterrent military power in East Asia. The single most important role for the United States in East Asia is to keep conflict off the table as a means of dispute resolution. If we do nothing else, we must focus on continuing to achieve this. Second, the United States must support the ability of regional states to expend scarce resources on their own counter coercion capabilities. By focusing on military deterrence, the United States allows regional states to allocate more of their defense resources on developing Coast Guard and other non-military capabilities necessary to withstand Chinese coercive pressure at sea. Third, the United States should continue to leverage the gravita gravitational power of international norms. The United States should continue to bring its di diplomatic power to bear to persuade and encourage parties to pursue diplomatic or institutional measures. Continued American leadership in this regard may also give encouragement to other states inclined to voice similar ex expectations. American persuasive power would also be strengthened by reassertion of the American leadership role over the development of international law of the sea. Since UNCLOS is the basis of modern international law at sea, the US should ratify the convention in order to more effectively exercise, maintain, and perpetuate its leadership and to strengthen the normative framework that UNCLOS provides. Finally, um, the United States, in my view, should remain neutral about sovereignty uh, but not about uh, drawing boundaries at sea. The American policy of neutrality on the outcome of sovereignty disputes, that is, disputes over the ownership of islands, rocks, and reefs, in my view, is a good one, as long as the dispute is resolved without the use of force. Our refusal to be drawn into conflict with a rising power over a piece of territory that is relatively trivial is an important aspect of regional and global stability. On the other hand, the United States has a strong interest in seeing the provisions of UNCLOS strengthened, since they provide the only near universal framework that decreases resource and security disputes in the maritime domain. The United States Department of State should issue a public official statement that challenges any right for China to use the Nine Dash Line as a basis for maritime boundary making. Not history, not power, but international law must be the standard. 
In the end, there may be nothing that can persuade China to abandon its power-based strategies for consolidating its control over the islands and other territorial features in the South China Sea. If so, China will have to pay the price for its policies, and that price may be that Chinese command sandbars, but not friends. To answer the question posed to the panel, as the disputes unfold over the coming months, years, and, and perhaps decades, the role of international law in the South China Sea will be to serve as the steady counterweight to the use of raw power. Thank you. Dr. Tang. Thank you, uh, Yeah, good morning. Uh, I, I have no power voice. The so virtuous I lawyer. Sit, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, first of all, I would like to express my sincere thanks for the, uh, to the organizer for inviting me to this important conference. And it is indeed a privilege for me to speak before this uh, distinguished audience. Uh, and uh, my topic is about the rule of law, unclosed, and the South China Sea. And let me ex first explain why I chose this topic. Uh, when I was invited by uh, CSIS to the conference and to uh, set a panel on the role of international law in managing disputes, I was excited, of course, but I was uh, nervous. I was nervous because I do not know what to talk. Uh, we are lawyers, and when we talk about dispute, we often talk about bringing dispute to court, and that is the end of the matter. Of course, uh, we can talk more about technical details, but I don't know whether uh, I can compete with uh, Mr. Basuto here, who is the architect of the <laughs> Philippine arbitration. Uh, so, but I, uh, my excitement is still greater than my nerve. So I try to find something to speak. And I look at the theme of the conference, and, and the theme of the conference is about managing tensions in the South China Sea. And the key word is tensions, and that strikes me. And I just have a question. Why do we have tensions? When we have international law to settle this, why do we still have tensions? So the idea of the rule of law comes up. And I think that I can talk more about the rule of law, and which is also a common theme in UNCLOS. And uh, that is uh, the, the reason for my choice to speak about the rule of law, UNCLOS, and the South China Sea without dispute or tensions. And um, when lawyers talk about the rule of law, we often refer to Dicey, the British uh, constitutional lawyer of the 19th century, who gave much substance to the, the phrase rule of law. And he identified three uh, basic elements of the rule of law, the absence of arbitral power, uh, the equality before the law, and the privilege of judicial process. And I will proceed my presentation on this basis. And uh, these three elements which are quintet, but uh, also distinct to some extent. So I will uh, discuss each element in turn and in connection with the uh, uh, with UNCLOS and the South China Sea. So first, about the, uh, the absence of arbitrary power. In domestic context, when we talk about the rule of law, the first element of the rule of law, the absence of arbitrary power, we talk about the constraints imposed on governments. Uh, at international level, we don't have a world government, but the idea is basically the same. We talk about constraints imposed by international law on states, on nations. And I think the most important thing, uh, international law, the most important development in international law in the last century is about the constraint on the use of force. The outlawry of the use of force Article 2, 4 of the United Nations Convention, uh, United Nations Charter, uh, speak about the prohibition of the use, a threat and use of force. And I think it's very important. And the, the prohibition of the use of force and threat of force is also clearly stated in UNCLOS. If you look at the preamble of the, the convention, it, talk, it talks about peaceful use of the sea. And Article one, uh, uh, 310, uh, articulate that idea by uh, expressly prohibiting the threat or use of force in activities at sea. And looking at the situation in the South China Sea and uh, hearing about the discussion, the intervention by speakers and participants yesterday, I think that 
that element of the rule of law, the non-user fault is not strictly observed. I think that, that many, in many occasions, violation of the prohibition on the use of force is <coughs> occurs. And one example is the, 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 the incident that, that uh, one of the speakers uh, and several speakers uh, talk about the firing uh, at Vietnamese vessel by the Chinese Navy in the South China Sea. That is a clear violation of the use of force. And also some of the speakers talks about uh, China's using its um, military cloud and to enforce laws throughout the South China Sea. And it strikes me that China does not provide clear basis for its enforcement, law enforcement activities in the South China Sea. Of course, we have a very generous statement by uh, the uh, Deputy Chief of Joint Staff of uh, PNA in uh, Singapore last week that China has sovereignty over the South China Sea. But it is not a clear legal basis. And talking about the legal basis, I want to move to the second element of the rule of law in international affairs. The second element of the rule of law is about equality before law. Of course, talking about equality in international law, we do not talk about uh, that every state have an equal rights. But the state have equal rights in like or similar situations. Of course, landlocked state cannot claim maritime zones. But the idea of the e equality before the law is that, first, you have to observe international law in a bona fide manner, in good faith. And the second aspect is that we have a, a comprehensive legal system. International law is not a a la carte choice where you can pick and choose the rules that it fit, better fit your interests. So uh, this, these two aspects uh, apply to every nation, big, big or small. And, but of course, I un we understand that uh, international, as I said earlier, international law set our constraints on states. But I must emphasize that those constraints and disadvantages are our weight overwhelmingly by, by the, the advantages that international law and international legal systems confers upon states. And that we have to bear that in mind. We have to pay that benefit, that the stability in the world that guaranteed by a comprehensive legal system brings to us. And the element uh, of equality before the law is also enshrined in UNCLOS. If we look at the history of the law of the Sea Convention, it is a need of the states to have a legal order for the oceans, though we don't have uh, competing activities to grab the resources of the sea. And that's the very idea of the, the law of the sea convention. The, and we have a, a convention which comprehensively regulates all activities at sea and almost all activity at sea. And, and the, the, the last president of the, con, the conference on the law of the sea, the third conference on the law of the sea, that led to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea over claimed that the UNCLOS is a constitution for the oceans. And indeed, the convention provides a comprehensive legal system for all activities at sea. And the principle of good faith is also guaranteed in UNCLOS. If you look at Article 300 of UNCLOS, it talks about good faith, non abuse of rights in implementing the convention. And now we, we compare that with the situation in the South China Sea. I don't think that the, the second aspect of the rule of law is strictly observed either. And uh, one of those problems, I think that uh, some of uh, many uh, speakers and participants raised yesterday is, is about the, the lack of clarity in China's NIDASH line. And, uh, but I can tell you that whatever uh, intention that China may have to introduce or to claim maritime areas in the South China Sea by the NIDASH lines is in violation of the second aspect of the rule of law, that is equality before law. And now I explain to you why. If China went back on its commitment and unclosed and used a NIDASH line as a claim uh, of historic waters in the South China Sea or the area of historic rights in the South China Sea. That is violate the first, um, 
the first aspect of the equality before the law, that no pick and choose among different rules. If you apply the unclosed, you have to apply it wholeheartedly and in the whole. And uh, if China's you the nationalize to denote its maritime areas in the South China Sea based on its claim sovereignty over the outcrop in the South China Seas, and we can see uh, Mr. Pauling very heavily depicted to us uh, the maximum maritime areas that uh, that can be generated by the disputed uh, feature in the South China Sea is significantly smaller than a nine-dash line. And of course, we know that there's some dif difficulty in interpretation of the provision of UNCLOS. And there may be uh, different and disputes occur in the interpretation application of UNCLOS. But that is exactly the time, I think, that the third element of the rule of law comes to the picture. That is, the, we have to privilege judicial process. And uh, the, the third element of the rule of law, the privilege of judicial process, is to give greater recognition of the role of international court and tribunals in settling, settling disputes. And uh, I may be considered silly because a lot of people think that, uh, that this aspect of the rule of law does not flare in, in Asian context, where Asian countries are less uh, legitimate than European partners, uh, European countries, and we have an ASEAN way to manage rather than settle the disputes. But if you look at uh, the several decades, <coughs> uh, the past, we have uh, Malaysia, Indonesia going to our IC ICJ, Malaysia, Singapore going to ICJ to settle their sovereignty island dispute. And we have uh, very recently Cambodia and, and Thailand go back to the ICJ to seek interpretation of an on a decision some 50 years ago. And uh, now uh, we have uh, in a little bit uh, further, we have uh, Myanmar, Bangladesh, and India went to Idlos for their maritime delimitation disputes. So I don't think that we have problem with using uh, litigation to set a dispute. And now, currently, as uh, Mr. Bensuto has told us, Philippines resort to uh, arbitration uh, procedure under UNCLOS to settle the dispute in the South China Sea, which were unfortunately rejected by China. Uh, but uh, I would not comment on, on the decision of China to, uh, to reject the arbitration, but I would like to highlight in a different context, China was a very active player in dispute settlement in using dispute settlement procedure, that is in the WTO. China stand ready to adhere to their commitments under WTO, and China make frequent use of the WTO dispute settlements. <clears throat> so my, my policy advice, if I may have, is very humble. I agree with my Vietnamese colleague, Mr. Thuy, uh, said yesterday that uh, international law is not observed, and that is the cause for tensions. And my very humble policy recommendation is that, very simple, going to the basic, rather than talking about the rule of international law, we're just upholding the rule of law. Thank you very much. I have some very quotation, but time is up. Thank you very much. <laughs> you. Well, uh, I th that was an excellent panel. Um, and, and I want to thank all of you uh, for your contributions. I'd like to open the floor to uh, questions, uh, same rules, just identify yourself and your organization. I'll go to the gentleman here uh, to start. My name is Michael Yehuda, and I'm uh, attached to George Washington University. Um, my question is really about the legal status as a whole of what the Chinese call the Nansha, Others call the Spratleys. What does it? Is it recognized in some sense legally as an entity? Is it some kind of archipelago? I mean, after all, some states claim only some islands. Others claim the whole of the islands. So, is there any uh, view of international law of the standing of this large number of islands and islets and shoals and so on? Is, is there some sense of common agreement as to what 
well, as to whether they constitute a unity in international law. Who'd like to, uh, uh, Henry, go ahead. Please use your mic. Thank you for the question, and uh, I think that question is very relevant because when you talk of Spratlys as if it's one entity, the truth is what we have is a political geography, even including the way the world is set up. Uh, it's not that God created the world, this is the United States, this is the Philippines, or this is Malaysia. What we have is actually the outcome of a historical evolution. And so these boundaries that we call geography is actually a political geography that we're speaking of. In the light of the Spratlys, it's the same thing. It's not as if uh, the Spratlys is one you know, entity. They are, the, the, this, uh, uh, this term refers actually to a, a group of several geological features uh, uh, depending on, on who the author is, it could number anywhere between a low of 65 to a high of 195. I guess it has something to do with the counting method. Some are counted as a cluster, others are individually. Aside from the fact that you have global uh, warming, and so some of the features have disappeared in the process. In terms of those surveys, for example, we have noted that 15 features have already been out of the map already. So in a sense, what you have here, uh, going back to your question, sir, is that there's no political agreement yet on that. And, and so what you see, therefore, in terms of the Spratis, and I will refer to it as, uh, as the neutral t term, uh, you have different claimants claiming different features. That's how it is, sir. Thank you. Did anyone else want to comment on that? Okay. Uh, Mr. Robinson here. <coughs> well, good morning. Um, I would like to make, if I could, some comments. Um, and again, I was the legal advisor at the time of the negotiation of the Law of the Sea Convention. I was in charge of the Gulf of Maine case, which was the first exclusive economic zone case, and I had the misfortune of also having to run the Nicaragua case through the uh, jurisdictional phase. Um, my first comment is that what I find very disturbing through this conference is that the People's Republic of China does not seem to recognize, in my opinion, humble opinion with all due respect, that what appears in its short-term interest may not be in its long-term interest. Uh, let's take, for example, the freedom of uh, navigation. Um, the South China Sea, I think it's fair to say, has been regarded as the high seas for what, 500 years, 600? 700, 2,000. Um, the freedom of navigation ultimately will be absolutely essential for the People's Republic of China. So why does the People's Republic of China want to take a position on freedom of navigation that is not only contrary clearly to the law of the sea negotiations, but I would argue is clearly not in its long-term interest. That is just an example. Um, when you mentioned subject to section three, uh, I would, with all due respect, I would do to differ. Uh, if you look at, for example, the North American Free Trade Agreement, you'll find many such sections. The law of the Sea Convention is the single longest, most complex multilateral treaty that has ever been negotiated. It's between four and 500 pages long. The NAFTA is over 1,000 pages long. You will find many subject to. I think if you looked at the uh, Geneva Conventions, you would also find a number of similar uh, propositions. Um, I would like also just to say is one thing out of interest. Um, the first major nation to tell an an international court to go to hell, I believe, was France in the uh, nuclear test case. And then uh, the United States, unfortunately, uh, we also mimicked that in uh, the Nicaragua case following the uh, jurisdictional decision. But we did argue jurisdiction. And um, in the case of the South China Sea, unfortunately, I would argue the problem now that China has is that 
if you take Article Two, um, if you take Article Two Eighty Six and Two Eighty. I'm sorry, in 298 and the Chinese declaration, when you ratified UNCLOS, they're not entirely in sync, and that is your problem. Uh, but in any event, in the uh, Nicaragua case and in the nuclear test case, while these two nations told the court to go to hell, both nations actually wrote a very detailed pleading as if they were in the case, even though they weren't, and they took it into the library of the International Court of Justice and placed it on the library table. And as far as I know, every single judge actually read those pleadings in both cases. So maybe China should think of doing something similar in the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Robertson. Uh, would anyone like to respond to that comment? Uh, Dr. Tang. Yes, I said earlier that I have uh, some quotation, and I just want to echo what uh, the former legal advisor of the U.S. State Department said. And I quote from a former legal advisor of the British uh, Commonwealth Office, uh, the late uh, Sir Arthur Watt. And he said that the rule of law is something which can be established overnight, either nationally or internationally. It benefits a long term, not short term. They are perceived not by short-sighted, but by those with far sight and insight. Thank you very much. Uh, Bonnie Glazier. Right here. Thank you so much. No, but can I? Oh, did you want to respond? Yes. Oh, Bonnie, sorry. Uh, uh, Dr. Zhang wanted to, to comment. Please uh, hit the microphone. Uh, yeah. uh, I'd like to thank the comments from Mr. Robinson. Uh, I think this is very interesting. Uh, <coughs> uh, well, I omit uh, the freedom of navigation because I think it's very clear from uh, if you look at the DOC and relevant Chinese uh, positions uh, regarding the freedom navigation in the South, East, the South China Sea, there's no doubt that the Chinese government position is the freedom of navigation should be respected in that region, in that area. Um, <coughs> I, I, my, my investigation of the case is, is quite different from yours, maybe. The first to say go to hell, the internet the court of the tri tribunal is not France. Uh, it's Guantanamo in the 1950s. Uh, in, the, in the first phrase, uh, Guantanamo did not participate in the Nordbaum case uh, where he was sued by uh, European, uh, uh, very little European countries. Um, <coughs> But in any way, I think this is a quite different um, story um, with regarding to the subject two provisions. Subject two, in in that, that case. But I would like to uh, to ask if you if you can give me the the, the NAFTA uh, treaty, because subject two, uh, I understand that there's a lot of uh, treaties. There are provisions incorporating the subject two, uh, but. But that is, that is very unusual in the compromissory clause. Uh, so if we look at the Nicaragua case and the oil platform case, the United States actually raised a similar um, objection, uh, but that not relied on the compromissory uh, clause, which is, I think, um, Article 21 of uh, the freedom of uh, friendship and freedom of navigation between uh, the U.S. and Nicaragua. Uh, there is a compromissory clause, but that, that, that in that clause is nothing of subject to. Uh, the U.S. relied rather on another substantive provisions. I think it's Article 20 something that uh, saying that th this pro uh, these provisions will probably will not deal with use of force something like all things concerning security. But that, that preclusion was not down in the compromissory clause. So that is quite different from here. This is much uh, similar if we go to the jurisdictional test of interpretation. That would be similar, in my view, uh, to the case of, um, of genocide uh, case where the Yugo uh, Yugosla Yugoslavia was sued by some the formal states of Yugoslavia, where they dispute actually on the term of whether or not there's an international dispute. 
in the compromise three clause. So that's, I think, is quite different. And that's make uh, equal footing, uh, in my view, uh, to give uh, a, a very strong backup of, of China in, in, in dissenting uh, the, the jurisdictional issues in the first phrase. Um, okay, that's all. Okay, great. Uh, Bonnie? Yes, thank you very much, uh, an outstanding panel. Uh, Bonnie Glazer, I'm a senior advisor at, uh, here for Asia here at CSI CSIS. I have a question for uh, Professor Zhang. Um, I'm not an international lawyer, <laughs> so maybe you can help me to understand this point. Um, I think I understood you to say that if China were to participate in this arbit arbitration uh, case, that it would be lending legitimacy to the Philippines' claim. And I don't really understand why that is the case. Um, I know that China has consistently said that it has indisputable sovereignty, but it has not denied that there is a dispute. Whereas, of course, in the East China Sea, uh, Japan not only says it has indisputable sovereignty, of course, using other language, but denies that a dispute exists. So my understanding is that China has always recognize that there are other claims, that there is a dispute. So why is it that simply participating in, the, um, in this uh, arbitral tribunal case would lend additional legitimacy to the Philippines' claim? Thank you. Indeed, um, uh, we, we can think that every dispute, uh, you can put it into uh, a historical political context. That is actually the argument uh, presented by, I think, Britain in the uh, Lockerbie case, as well as in the, by Iran in the, in the um, Iranian, in the hostage case. Um, so, <coughs> That, that is, people will tend to think that, well, you come to court and sue me, and that claim or the dispute, whatever you package, is in the, in the great context of, of, uh, of this uh, political structure. But here, I think the story is different here. What I say uh, is that, uh, in my view, that... Um, um, Philippines' application uh, was made uh, fundamentally based on um, a precondition that there is uh, some of the islands was belongs to, and there is no dispute to the Philippines, uh, and there is uh, no question of the territory disputes in the Nanshai Islands, whatever you think the entity of the islands would be. Um, Therefore, that, that is a very well, I, I will think, that's very well uh, uh, packaged uh, case. Uh, I, I know that they have very good lawyers. But, uh, well, anyway, the <laughs> this is especially on the territorial uh, disputes, which uh, China would think, it's not merely as a, as a historical or political context, but something fundamentally uh, fall in the very nature of, of the dispute that the Philippines package, or it's inseparable to any claims that the Philippines may raise. Okay, uh, Dr. Emerson, uh, Don. Thank you, thank you. Don Emerson, Stanford University. Okay, I would like to zero in on what to me is the sort of looming issue uh, and I'd like, I'd like the panel to focus rather narrowly, if I may, on this issue. Uh, I see two questions. The first question is, will the arbitral court declare its own jurisdiction? Under, I gather, competence, competence, but I don't need to know the background of whether that's you know German or Latin or whatever. I just need to know what particularly our friends from China and the Philippines uh, think about the reasoning that is likely to drive a decision on jurisdiction in one direction or, or another. Now, it seems to me that from Professor Zhang's presentation, uh, there are 
two possibilities, as I see it, uh, but I'm an outsider here and I'm not versed in the legal details. Uh, one is that it is infected, the Philippine submission is infected by sovereignty, by issues of ownership of what you call the Nansha Islands, that is the Spratleys. And therefore, it will be thrown out. The whole submission will be thrown out on those grounds. It is also possible, perhaps, that they might argue that demarcation issues are unavoidably implicated in the Philippine submission, and that on those grounds it will be rejected. But I leave it up to you, but please clarify for me the arguments why we should believe that the court will say, yes, we have jurisdiction, and why they might say the opposite. No, we do not have jurisdiction. And if you could predict the outcome, I would be even happier. The second question has to do with the situation if they decide that they do have jurisdiction. And then what happens? And I won't go through the various possibilities except to suggest one which strikes me as a lay person, you know, who, who doesn't like lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. As a lay person, is it not quite possible, if not even likely, that if the arbitral court says, yes, we have jurisdiction, they will find the Philippine submission rulable, if I, that, that's a word, on only one count, namely whether or not the nine dash line is in conformity with UNCLOS. And there are all the other stuff. I think there are 13 different requests, but I haven't read it in quite a while, so I'm not really sure. Uh, and the word sovereignty uh, does appear in the Philippine submission several times, right? Uh, l let's not get into those details, but I want you to respond specifically to this prediction that if the court decides, yes, we have sovereignty, they will rule the nine-dash line incompatible with UNCLOS, which will have at least a moral effect on Beijing, but the rest of the Philippine submission, either they will reject it or not comment at all. The first question, uh, I think it's very clear that the court uh, will have the competence to decide the jurisdiction of their own. Uh, you can argue that they don't have jurisdiction, but you have to uh, wait uh, for the court to decide. That's very clear. Uh, uh, but it doesn't mean <coughs> it doesn't mean that uh, the state choose not to participate, uh, cannot present uh, their, their explanations on why they don't uh, participate. <coughs> that is. Uh, um, I, I just give my views. Uh, it could be wrong, could be silly, but I give you my explanations, not necessarily the government's. The second one is on the U-shaped line. I would like to uh, have you pay attention to this, the very nature of declaratory judgment in, in the legal term. It is, though not very, uh, it's sometimes also, um, invoked uh, that request raised by by the applicant countries and the court, ICJ, PCIJ, did make declaratory judgment. But <coughs> you may you may ha have um, uh, I think that the fundamental rule of the court to, to settle the dispute, rather than make a declaration on what is right, what is wrong. So that is the main function. Especially in terms of arbitration, I will start, uh, and I assume myself, if I'm a judge, I will better not go that far in implementing my function as a judicial organ set by the convention in deciding or adjudicate dispute concerning the dispute arising out of the convention. Uh, Henry, would you like to comment? Uh, sir, thank you for your question. Uh, it allows me to discuss the last part of my presentation, and I'd like to explain it in a... I didn't understand Let me try to explain it in a non-lawyer fashion, because like you. I, I think that's what Don was asking right. for. Uh, so I'll, be, I'll, I'll try to reduce it in a layman's term. I think the first point we have to remember is that under international law, we're talking of in general, consent is necessary to bring another party. So it has to be mutual consent. 
Act. Now we go to the specific case of UNCLOS. In the case of UNCLOS, that consent has been given when the party ratified UNCLOS. In this case, the question is, did... No, because of 2006. I, I will go into that, sir. I'm trying to do it step by step. All right, in the case of UNCLOS, sir, China and the Philippines have both acceded, ratified UNCLOS. Consent was given. However, in UNCLOS, reservation is allowed. And so I'll go to your reservation. Four things cannot, will not allow UNCLOS to have jurisdiction. The first point, sir, it cannot decide on sovereignty questions because UNCLOS has been designed not to address sovereignty questions. It's about maritime entitlements. Uh, the, the, the last three ones would be on the reservations. What are these reservations? Maritime delimitation, as discussed, military operations, and issues which are in the agenda of the, of the UN Security Council. These are the three reservations which China made. Now, outside of these four issues, what is the default? The general rule is compulsory jurisdiction. Therefore, if you merge the two, can you therefore bring an issue and apply compulsory jurisdiction outside of the four issues? The answer is yes, because the general rule, the residual rule, governs. All right. Now you go to the specific question. What are the issues brought therefore by the Philippines? Do they fall under any of these? Let's go to the sovereignty. Are we asking the tribunal to decide on who is the owner of the future? No, sir. We're not asking that. What we are asking, if a feature is an island or a rock or a low tide elevation, if they are of such character, what are the maritime entitlements of those features under UNCLOS? And so it is therefore refer, refers to uh, entitlements of these features under Article 121. And so we're not going into any of, of these uh, uh, reservations made. What we are asking the court actually is to address those issues. If they are of this nature, what is the maritime entitlement? Now one can say, but one thing leads to another. In the same way, in our life, it's like that. But when you look at UNCLOS, you can, you can actually relate everything. I can say that we're both relatives under Adam and Eve. We can make all those cause and effect, but that's not how the way law operates. There is such as a direct and proximate cause and effect. So we have to make that distinction. When you look at UNCLOS, it makes two distinct concepts the concept of maritime entitlement and the concept of maritime delimitation. They are not fused together, though they are interrelated, they're not necessarily one and the same. And so essentially UNCLOS, and uh, we've shown it, talks about maritime entitlements that any particular state is entitled to. So that's how it is. Now, having said that, having said that therefore, is it in, an, in our interest to have un, uh, the tribunal uh, decide on this? I would say, sir, from my perspective, yes, because it will affirm international law and the rule of law. We take out the role the tribunals play, what do you have? Law of the jungle. Talk about negotiation, sir, it's a power play. It's a question of who's, who has more power and who has not. Law levels the playing field based on an objective standard. And this is exactly what we're saying. This is the point why we have brought the matter before a third party adjudication. China says one thing, we say another thing, both invoke international law. Is it therefore better for both of us to have a third party settle between the two of us what is the correct interpretation of law? And so what appears to be a legal issue will actually have far-reaching consequences in terms of economics and politics. Because politically speaking, therefore, if we don't follow certain norms and principles by, uh, in terms of how we interact with each other, it's always the powerful who will dictate the terms. If that is the, if that is the future international system that we want, I think that's going to be problematic. If we go by that, we lay the foundations for future conflict. This is the time by which we have to lay the correct principles by which we may have short-term disputes right now, but if we settle 
these issues which keep on hounding us, we are going to ensure, my sense, at least uh, a future that will be more stable. That is the pol political consequence of what we're doing, sir. So I hope the, the, on the, on the I cannot give you more details because I don't want to lay down Peter, uh, details of, of, of the legal issue. Peter, you wanted to comment. I think Dr. Zhang wants I do, you want I to do. Well, you get four lawyers, five opinions. So, um, so you're um, uh, directly to answer your question. All right, and it's important that you, you be patient and, and, and hear some of these things because you can't get an, a, a, a black and white answer. It's not possible, and here's why. Will the arbitral uh, panel declare jurisdiction? There are three possibilities. Possibility one is that they'll choose to do a bifurcated decision, meaning that they'll rule on jurisdiction first, and then if they find it, move on to the merits, right? That's a possibility. They did that, uh, the International Court of Justice did that in the Nicaragua, Colombia case, if I remember, and it resulted in certain complications, frankly, in the case. So the second possibility is that there'll be a package decision. <laughs> I think this is probably the more likely approach, that there'll be a package decision on jurisdiction that talks in detail about the merits. So when they, when they figure out what all of the issues are, whether the four uh, uh, areas that you can't rule on are separated out and there's anything left over, then you'll get a jurisdiction opinion and a decision all at the same time, that second approach, the package approach. Um, and so you may get an answer, uh, a, a definitive answer, uh, with the jurisdiction decision on the merits of the case as well at the same time. But either way, in that package approach, you're going to get guidance on the law, right? So that's the, the, the value of the package approach is that they're going to have to go through all the legal and, and, and technical ge geographical analysis. And so there'll be a lot, of, uh, a lot of information offered about what the opinion would be if they, ha if they had jurisdiction, even if they don't find it. So that's a very important possibility, I think. And, and even if they choo find that they don't have jurisdiction, I hope that's what they do. Because this is an area where we're begging for some clarity right now. Um, <clears throat> the third possibility is that the negotiations uh, end up withdrawing the case and you don't get an answer. Right? So no, no jurisdictional answer or no legal answer. Um, I predict, I'm going to give you a prediction. You asked for it. Um, yes, they will find that there is a narrow band of jurisdiction available. And it's going to deal with Article 121.3, and, and that would be a blessing to the world if they do find that, because Article 123 is a very difficult, that's, the, that's a rock versus island, 12 versus 200, who, we don't know, right? So state practice is all over the map, and the U.S. is just as bad as anybody else. So, um, so the, the bottom line is the, the international legal community would benefit greatly uh, by getting some clarity on Article 123, and I think they can find jurisdiction on Article 123. Here's an example. Scarborough, uh, Scarborough uh, Shoal is actually has, uh, I think the answer is five, maybe six, rocks that are above water at high tide. The Nicaragua Columbia case reaffirmed what was already law, which says that any piece of, uh, of naturally formed territory above water at high tide is subject to sovereignty if it's as small as this picture or as big as, you know, uh, a continent, right? So, so the, the, the bottom line is uh, there's, uh, there is sovereign territory on Scarborough Shoal. Five rocks, at least. So uh, tw you draw 12 miles around them at a minimum, right? That's what Article 121.3 says. Um, and then the question is, is there any, any piece of the shoal that's left over that would be international waters if Article 121.3 limits the ability of the coastal state to reach beyond 12 miles? And the answer to that, as I understand the geography, is yes. And if that's the case, then both the Philippines and China would have the right to fish there. Right, so the, the, I think the court can find jurisdiction over at least that narrow issue. So your second question is, will the court give an answer on the nine dash line, right? No, the court won't give an answer directly on the nine dash line. Uh, here's my prediction, right, as, as a lawyer, right? I, uh, frankly, I hope they do. I hope they, give, I hope they find a way to prove me wrong, but why, why wouldn't they? Because, because China hasn't defined what the nine dash line is. The fact that it's ambiguous makes it hard for the court to rule what it is. We don't know what it is. So what will they do instead? If I were on the court, this is what I would do. I would rule by implication. i say, I don't know what the nine-dash line is, but here's the rules that you have to follow. Right? And so, in other words, ignore the nine-dash line. Tell the parties, here's the rules you have to follow. The rules are geography, 12 miles. Uh, Article 121.3 limits beyond that. Therefore, there is a continental shelf. And that continental shelf uh, appertains to certain geography, right? Not to 
history or power or anything else that appertains to geography. So this is how I think, if, if I remember the arbitral panel, that's how I would rule. Um, so um, I don't know, maybe we, we'll get one more opinion and then we'll all vote. Uh, yeah, actually, Dr. Zhang is gonna have the last word and then we have to wrap up. Okay, Peter, I, <coughs> I very much refrain myself from predicting any, anything that caught. I think that put my career under a uh, great risk. <laughs> um, the reason is that uh, you never know what the judge was, what, the, 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 what is mentality, what is, what is you, you never, you can hardly. So there are possibilities and I better not predict. But one thing, I almost uh, for sure that uh, the bifurcation could hardly be possible. Um, it, of course, it depends on the procedures. Well, better I will not predict anything here, but uh, it depends on the procedures, and the procedures will be made by the five judges. Um, well, when China did not participate, China will 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 lose the power to say anything on that procedure. So I I don't think those uh, the judges if they want to ha to get more payment, the better to prolong this, you know, it's a, well, I better not say that. Um, <coughs> uh, on Henry's, um, I have always the question, as I, I agree with you, that UNCLOS uh, prescribes rules on the entitlement of, um, of the, the Marian entitlement. Um, but that come back to my question, how can the judge decide the entitlement without deciding the, ter the ownership of, of, of the Nanshan Island? So that is the dilemma they will, make, they will face. And in that sense, they may somehow hear the objections from China, uh, which, uh, well, maybe my view, I presented in my presentation on the first aspect. And the second, I completely disagree with you on your perception of rule of law, emphasizing, um, if not exclusively, but mainly on the third party uh, jurisdiction. I understand Philippines is a small country. Uh, they, f they, have, uh, they fear that they, they, they will be disadvantaged in the bilateral negotiation with China. Uh, but I would like to have you look at uh, the history, the, the practice, the state practice. Uh, I understand that you have the fear, but the fear would be, I think, for for our health, we we, we better, you know, if we 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 do have some concrete uh, evidence to supporting such a fear. Otherwise. Um, you know, we. <coughs> so the the history is that um, you know that we have the the Tonkin Bay Agreement with Vietnam, um, and uh, you know that uh, the U ship line you originally had eleven parts, <coughs> but one part in the Tonkin Bay has been deleted. Uh, well, and finally deleted as a result of this agreement. Um, so in that sense, I think um, uh, the South China Sea issues in, in the Chinese perspective, maybe also in Philippines perspective, and also in the literal states perspective in, in that uh, semi-enclosed sea, is a very complicated issue involving uh, uh, history and p special political context. Uh, uh, that that is the reason I th I think that people uh, all the little states in the semi uh, enclosed sea region, um, uh, in accordance with the provisions Article uh, one two three I guess, uh, to to negotiate for a, a, a result uh, a management of that uh, of that region. In that sense, I think the, distorial, uh, the territory dispute over the islands or the features um, looks inseparable from the other things. Uh, well, then I suggest we better to put 
put them together as a package uh, in the negotiation for for the future management of the South China Sea, which is indeed a semi-enclosed sea. We, nobody can actually, can take back by using our force, no matter how strong your claim would be over the features and islands in the Nansha. That, that is, I think China will not do that. And that has been reflected by the 2002 DOC, which is very clear intention of the of the parties in respecting the status quo. So in that case, you, you can hardly, you know, just talk one aspect of the whole package by ignoring that exactly prohibited by uh, the enclos, because the enclos itself is a package deal. Uh, <laughs> Henry, a really quick, please. Uh, uh, very quick points. One. Arbitration is a very serious matter. You don't go into that overnight. The reason why we're going into the arbitration is precisely because negotiation was not going anywhere. And two decades was mentioned. It's more than two decades, <laughs> actually. The problem is there's also urgency. Why? I've shown you what is happening in the South China Sea. There has to be a connection between articulation and also what's happening. As we speak right now, a union is under threat. Force is not going to be used, but what happened in Scarborough? What happened in a union right now? What is happening there right now? So there is a sense of urgency. This is something that you have to prolong, delay, because status quo will be different 10 years from now. That status quo changed from mischief reef when the DOC was concluded in 2002. What was the status quo? Status quo was mischief reef. After, after DOC was concluded, what's the status quo now? Scarborough is under threat so many sovereignty patrols. So in a sense, therefore, it's not just a question of a theoretical solution. This must ha have grounding on what's actually happening on the ground. My, th my third point, I will have to disagree with that on, on the nine dash line, but I, I cannot lay out details on that because that is a matter that will have to be addressed in the memorials. <laughs> I will have to, uh, uh, second, it's not, it's not true that there's ambiguity on the nine dash line. We have documents in our position, possession which says they have indisputable sovereignty. And that's the very reason why there's an assertion on the Reed Bank and areas three and four. What is the reason for that? Not, so there is an indisputable sovereignty claim on that. And so this is our point. There are, you cannot, you cannot exercise that too much flexibility in terms of saying one day and then another thing on another day. Maybe it's better that let's settle this once and for all, what exactly it is. Uh, then it makes it easier for us now to talk on the same language. Uh, my <coughs> final point, uh, well, I'll, I'll forgo the final point. I Ladies and gentlemen, I think I, uh, I've proven the point that you cannot control four lawyers uh, on a panel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Please join me in thanking them very much. <laughs>